Hello. Hello. Welcome to Foster Talk with Dr. John and special guest, Jen Lilly. She actually should be should joining, joining us here any minute here. This is Tuesday night, uh, January 26th. Happy Australia Day. This is a special edition of Foster Talk with Dr. John. We have with us our special guest who will be joining us here, Jen Lilly, foster parent extraordinaire. You may know her from Hallmark movies. You may know her from... Uh, from a number of soap operas, soap opera, years in soap opera, uh, tremendous advocates for children in foster care. She's adopted some children herself, uh, tremendous advocates, as I said, and a real great parent. So she's going to be joining us here. I expect her to join us here any second here, but this is Foster Talk with Dr. John and how we do it here. If you're new, welcome. If you've been with us before, so glad you're back with us. We have three rules, three rules as Jen joins us, hopefully any minute here. Three rules, and that is rule number one. Tag a friend, let your friends know that you're here so they can join us, so they can be part of this program as well, because no one understands your lifestyle. No one gets exactly what you are doing unless it is another foster parent. So any foster parent you know, invite them to come so they can share with us and we can share with them and we can learn from them as well. Rule number two, get those fingers flying, ask anything you want, anything from me, Anything from our special guest, Jen Lilly, who I expect to join us here any minute. Um, parenting, adoption, kinship, um, foster care, you name it, we're going to answer your questions tonight. And I hope to. You want to ask about Jen's latest movie, what she's doing in Canada right now, or about some of the books we're working on, or whatever it might be. We want to answer your question. Third rule, third rule, my favorite rule, and perhaps your favorite rule too, and that is this. If somebody makes a comment, if somebody asks a question, you think, Dr. John, Jen, wait a minute, I think I can answer that question. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you have to say. So, so let us know. So chime in, share your advice, share how you did it. Give us your opinion on something. Share us your experience so we all can learn together because that's what we do. We learn together from each other. Um, you know, I've been a foster parent myself to over 60 plus children. You know that if you've been here before. And every day, I, oh, there's Jen right there. I'm going to say, Yay. hey, um, glad you're here with us. Welcome to the special edition of Foster Talk with Dr. John and Jen. We're just talking about the rules here, how people can ask anything they want and chime in. And, and there's Jen. Jen is a, if you don't know Jen's story, she is a oh, tremendous foster parent and adoptive parent. She's done lots of movies. Uh, 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 soap operas, and I was talking to a friend today, earlier today, and I'm afraid, is it Days of Our Lives? Yes, Days of Our Lives and General Hospital. Okay, and you are in Canada right now, right? Yes, I'm in Canada getting ready to do another Hallmark movie. And we are talking about this last week, Jen, you just had an adoption. You just went through the adoption process in California, and then when that ended, you pretty much um, had a, a life change as well right? Yes. So can you tell us a little bit, as we're getting those questions starting to come in here, can you tell us a little bit about how your adoption process went in California during this time of COVID? Because it's a lot, the adoption process right now is so different than it was a year ago. Um, you know, the court system looks different right now. So can you give us a little bit of insight about how your adoption process went during this era of COVID? Sure. Also, I just realized I don't have my ring on because I had a fitting the other day, but I am still married. <laughs> I put my ring on. I should reference. You're like, oh, you got divorced. No. Um, so, anyway, so yeah, you know, it was hard. It was weird. It was a weird case for us because um, Jeffrey's case, like probably a lot of people can relate to, was in a different county than we reside. So we live in Los Angeles, and Jeffrey's case was in Kern County, um, which is Bakersfield. So that complicated things. Um, I know COVID, one of the complications was Sacramento was closed for a while. And so um, his acknowledgement from the state that he had been freed for adoption right. got lost. Um, so that took a while. Um, and then LA started doing like Zoom, Zoom, um, you know, adoptions, which a lot of places are doing and Kern County was behind. And so there was a whole back and forth of like, do we want to transfer the case? But then that's more bureaucracy and more paperwork. So, I mean, I think like everybody's, it kind of just was delayed a little, but luckily we got ours done still. And I think that there is, at least in California, there's still an urgency to get these adoptions through. They're just trying to figure out technology. And I think they're starting to work that out. You know, I was doing an interview 
interview today earlier with CBS out of New York about a, uh, a child who was placed in foster care home, their, really their first placement, and the child tragically died um, under the foster home, under the foster parents' watch. And we've talked about how COVID has really changed all the rules for foster care. Uh, so many foster parents right now are feeling uh, a level of anxiety level they didn't fear a year ago. With the children in their homes, the anxiety levels are going up because of no therapy sessions in person, no counseling sessions. They're not meeting their birth parents face to face. They're not getting the school support services. And the parents are at home caring for those children anxieties for the roof. The parents are also struggling with their own fact that can I put food on my table? Will I still have a job? Um, how can I care for this child? who's got anxiety levels, and my own concerns about um, COVID. So foster care really is in a sort of a, a challenge right now, and agencies are trying to scramble, and one of those answers might be that virtual, the use of virtual technology, kind of like your adoption. You, you said it was virtual, right? Well, we was. ended up going in person, um, right. but it was, it was like stunk, you know, because it was really fast, and they tried to get our family on zoom which was great but like the camera was behind us and you couldn't hear anything and you couldn't see anything and it just went very fast for some reason because of covid right. um it, uh, sorry i uh, you keep going okay i, I have a no worries i get it uh, this is foster talk with dr john and jen lily our special guest tonight jen lily our co-host okay. answering your questions what do you need help with right now what is the number one thing you're struggling with? i want to say hello to Pete the cat i see Pete the cat is here with us tonight michael is here and then i see michelle is here i see that ashley is here and debbie hey guys so glad you're all this here tonight craig is here welcome craig glad you're here with us tonight and lisa's Sorry. here like no worries and Lisa, thank you for joining us tonight. So again, what are you struggling with right now? What is the number one issue you're facing with right now? Is it visitations? Is it the adoption process? Is it issues of the ch because your children are not getting therapy sessions or counseling sessions? I hear a lot, Jen, I hear a lot from foster parents across country. And they're saying, Dr. John, the visitations are so different right now. We have to do it just like you and I are doing it right now, virtual. And foster parents, some of them, well, actually many of them are telling me they feel it's almost a sense of invasion of their privacy right. in their house because they've got to set up the computer in their own home and they feel they're not getting much, much privacy at all as foster parents because they feel there's a sense of intrusiveness into their own home. Uh, have you heard anything like that at all? Or, or if someone were to ask that question, what would you say to them about that? About you know, that I don't sentence? know, I have heard it. Um, yeah. I didn't loaded question. I didn't experience it because Jeffrey's TPR had already happened before COVID, luckily. Um, so I feel for everybody that's going through that. The only thing I'm thinking of off the top of my head is, that could be a positive is, um, man, that's tricky, is, you know, potentially you could record those visits if something was really going poorly with the parent and you needed video proof. Um, I hate to say that, but, you know, the problem with that too that's awful is is the fact that you know how is a child supposed to bond because we are going for reunification you know especially when they're an infant it's you know anybody that has an infant you can relate to this i can relate to this with fostering infants they i can barely you know facetime with my own children they don't they don't have the attention span right. to sit there in front of a screen which i which is what i've heard a lot right from people and i you know i don't know any advice other than that really makes a case hard. And I would think that they'd be going back to in-person visits by now with just masks and protocol. I mean, we're not, if this is not March, 2020, we know more about COVID, we know more about how it's spread. So why can't we, you know, modernize like the rest of the world and just put protocol into place? I don't know. Well, certainly, certainly the help. And I'm a firm believer that children need to have uh, connections, that one-on-one -on -one personal uh, human touch of you with with their birth parents that helps with the reunification yeah. process. Uh, Phoebe Cat asks, my question is, what does a day look like with four kids under five? You're almost there, Jen. Three of them under five, starting at seven a.m., ending at eight p.m. at night. Very lost. Just except expected two more for a total of four. Well, um, Jen, I know you've had a, a lot of kids. What you've got three kids in your own home under four. What does that look like in your home? I mean, I think it looks like most people's homes. You're the expert, Dr. John, because you're an expert anyway, but you've also have 
grown children. So you would better know. But I mean, for me right now, you know, there are moments where I think you just have to yeah. choose your battles. You let me know if this is yeah. bad parenting advice. Like, you know, <laughs> that I call Dr. Don now. Because I'm like, is this normal? Um, you know, I have two boys and a girl. So I have a four-year-old boy, two-year-old boy, their brothers, uh, obviously they're full brothers because of adoption. And I have a one and a half-year-old girl. So what my house looks like a lot of times is laughter, but also chaos, you yeah. know? Yeah. They do listen, but they don't always listen. And, um, you know, we do a lot of timeouts. There's a lot of timeouts where my four-year-old is screaming. My four-year-old sometimes, even though he should be beyond the age of tantrums, is screaming because it's like he uh, kind of chooses to regress in that moment to get the attention that my one-year-old right. gets, right? Like, oh, well, when Julie does this, she gets attention, where with Caden, it kind of backfires. And sometimes they play really nicely, and it can be one second to one second. It'll be like, so sweet, you know? Hey, Jack, wanna come play with me? Oh, great job, Jack, you're doing so good. And you have those moments as a parent where you're like, God, I love these manners. They're sharing. This is so easy, fantastic. 30 seconds later, it's they're hitting each yeah. other and there's timeouts and they're being separated and I don't like him. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. And we have moments where they don't eat their favorite food and you're like, it's a freaking peanut butter and jelly. You're not gonna eat this for dinner. Great. So do I just give you milk and send you to bed or do we play the game where I decide to not fight this battle and just like give in and give you some cheese, you know? <laughs> so. I don't know. Like it's, it depends on how tired I am. I try to be consistent. Obviously that's an important thing with parenting, but I think unless it's something horrible, like hitting, you know, if they're yeah. not going to eat their PB and J, sometimes I'm like, I can just give them two cups of milk and let them go to bed. You know, I think you're right there. So I don't know. You've got to be consistent. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You got to be consistent, but you've also got to pick your battles. And sometimes you just got to say, you know what, I've got to roll with it and be flexible. Uh, I remember at Christmas, we had seven in diapers. We had, I think, 11 kids. We had seven in diapers, and, and I'm a diaper guy. My wife does hair. I do diapers. And there was one morning when I had seven, I had, I had uh, four babies in cribs, and I had three in front of me on a bed. And, I'm, and I've got an elbow like that, all right? So I'm trying to change three diapers at a time, and I'm, re and I'm dressed like this, ready to go to speech, and one baby just trooped all over me, and I thought, you know what? This is just this is just how it's going to be. It's just going to how it's going to be. I got to roll with. It. I got to laugh at this. I got to roll with it. Uh, and that's, sometimes you just do the best you can. Sometimes you just survive and 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 go on to the next battle, if you will. Um, you know, and then you drink coffee. Yeah. Well, I don't drink coffee. I drink hot chocolate. But I tell you, some parents, some parents say, "How do you how do you do?" And I think, well, gosh, I really I don't drink alcohol, but there are days when I think I should. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, um, Aubrey says, our 12-year-old had only been, in, hey, Aubrey, thank you for joining us, had only been in, our 12-year-old had been in school months prior to him being placed. He is at a kinder level and can't read or write. A struggle is school. He needs one-on-one -on -one the entire six hours a day, school day, to get to know what's going on. Assignment, if I can't, let me read more here, if I can't read what's on the computer, he can't partake. If he can't read the computer, hey, Aubrey, I completely understand what you're going through. So many children in foster care are so far behind academically. They struggle with reading and math skills. They're at least 18 months behind academically. And when they go from school to school to school, Aubrey, they fall further and further and further behind. And right now during COVID, as these kids are not in school and they're trying to distance learn and they're spending hours a day in the computer, first of all, we've got to be honest and know that they're not going to be spending the entire time on the computer which is so many challenges right there and ages right there. But so many foster parents really aren't equipped to teach these kids at home because they have their own job, they have their own work, they don't know how to, to meet these children's educational levels. So Aubrey, I understand your struggle completely. Um, Jen's gonna be there in a couple of years when her, her kids are in school and that's a whole different challenge, particularly in this, in this um, day of digital learning. I think schools right now are finding out that it's not what they thought it would be. I think so too. And I would think, I mean, my only recommendation would be try to find a tutor, but I don't even know if that's, that would, who would be willing to come right. to your home and help um, right. or ask your social worker if there's like a, if a program like that, there's gotta be some sort of program like that. Yep. Well, it, there, there may be in some states, but again, every, every state right now, every agency is just scrambling to, to create new rules to fit COVID when the rules are changing almost every single right. day. Agencies are struggling with that. Rachel says the inconsistence of school. 
Thank you, Rachel. My little guy is five and in kindergarten. Local school system is sometimes virtual, sometimes in person. He has unspecified conduct and trauma disorder. School won't allow him to attend full days like his peers. He can only attend three hours, four days per week. He currently has one-on-one -on -one aid. We are working on the IEP process. What can I do to support my son? Rachel, so glad you asked. And thank you for joining us. The number one thing you can do, Rachel, is to be his advocate. You are his greatest advocate. Those teachers, Rachel, are not going to understand. Well, let me, let me say this, Rachel. Before I was a foster parent, I was a high school teacher. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really understand what children in foster care went through because I hadn't experienced it. I had myths and misconceptions. Um, and then I became a foster parent and recognized, oh my gosh, my fellow teachers have no clue because there's no training about what these children go through, their traumas and their anxieties and, and being displaced from home and going to new schools. Uh, the, the counselors don't have it, the school administrators don't have it. And this is somebody who's worked on schools in two different continents. So Rachel, you've got to be his number one advocate. You've got to let these teachers know that these are the services that he needs. You need to be documenting all this for his caseworker so they can understand what he's going through. Um, and sometimes you gotta be the squeaky wheel, the squeaky wheel who makes noise. Don't be afraid to nag that school, Rachel, and say, hey, my child, because he's your child in your home, my child needs this, my child needs this, my child needs this. Um, again, advocacy equals awareness. So when you bring that advocacy to the school, you help them become aware of what his needs are. What do you think, Jen, about that? I think that's a really great answer. And I just, I'm just like feeling for this mom. And I would also add that, you know, when you said advocacy equals awareness, it also made me think you are also paving the way for other children in the future that may, you know, and other foster parents in the future. And I'm sorry that you have to bear that load, but hopefully your advocacy will carry on and affect other children. Absolutely right. Well, thank you, Jen. Heather's here. Hello there. Welcome. What can I expect from our first dependency court date if mother hasn't done a single thing to work the case plan? Jen, what do you think about that? I'm just smiling for you because, you know, while you, you root for reunification, sadly, you know, it's, I, I find so much positive in a mom that is not doing anything because at that same time, then there's not a push, pull, push, pull. She's doing half of her case. She's not doing half of her case. So we're just going to keep extending her and like, you know, drag this child through the system longer. Hopefully you want to adopt that child. And if you do, it's really going to go in your favor because uh, I have found that judges have very little tolerance for parents who do absolutely zero. When they do a little bit, it extends and extends and extends and extends and extends and it's painful. When they do nothing, uh, your case is probably going to go by quicker. What do you think, Dr. John? That's been my experience. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Heather says, baby's two months old. We picked up from the hospital. She left him alone and hasn't seen him since. Heather, I would strongly encourage yeah. you to make sure you have all that documented so uh, you can present this to the court if needed or you can present it to the car so or guardian live item in case the caseworker does not pick up on that. But yeah, you know, as Jen says, many times these, these judges will have very little tolerance when it comes to parents, the birth parents not doing their caseload or very, very slow behind. While the end goal is reunification, at the same time, the judges as well want permanency. They want permanency for these children. They want these children placed in a home where they're gonna be kept safe, um, a stable, consistency, that love that they need. And um, the longer the child remains in care, the more issues they're gonna have. I have worked with some children. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I, <laughs> you were done. I, I just... have worked with some kids who have been in 40 different homes. Can you imagine? 40 different homes and their levels of trust and attachment are pretty much non-existent. I would say too, if it's, you know, if you've had that baby since birth and the baby's only two months old, that is a slam dunk in your direction as well as a foster parent, if you're hoping to adopt. Um, because you're, you are literally, it is not arguable. You are the only parent that child has known that very much bodes in your Jen, family. um, what was the youngest you've had placed in your home? Um, Jeff was three months, three months. when we got him. Okay. So three months. All right. Okay. I remember we had a baby, uh, baby was 10 weeks premature. This is something I've never heard before. The doctors actually removed the baby from the mother's womb because if the mother would not stop taking her drugs. So the doctors got a court order to do so. Had never heard of that happening before. Uh, we got the baby when the baby was five weeks premature still. 
Um, it weighed under five pounds. It was on a breathing machine um, and had to be fed every 90 minutes. Um, so I recall, that was my, I was on duty. I recall 11 o'clock at night, 12.30 at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, sleeping in the couch. Um, that was actually our third failed adoption. We tried to adopt poor little Marquez. Um, you know, there's something... I love babies. I just love having babies in my, in my home. So Heather, I say congratulations. Good for you. Keep up that work. I know you're doing a great job for that baby. And thank you for, thank you for taking care of that little one. Uh, Keisha's here. I hope I pronounced it correctly, Keisha. Thank you for joining us. I'm having trouble getting other family members approved to babysit while I work or attend class due to my sister making false accusations out of spite. I'm currently doing kinship. What should I do? I have missed many work many times but 15 months later, I still don't have childcare outside of daycare hours. The family I'm asking to be approved doesn't have a background, but bio mom is making it hard for me. Well, Keisha, what I would recommend you do is, uh, first of all, Keisha, you need to understand that sometimes when you are caring for a child that's related to you, sadly, there may be some of those, those relatives of yours who don't agree with your decision, or they might think, well, I'm not gonna follow those foster care rules. And I have seen some of the times that families have contention of result. There might be some faith-based organizations, Keisha, in your area who could help you in regards to childcare. A lot of churches right now are recognizing that there's a need out there, an outreach ministry, if you will, in their own church, in their own community. So they might be able to help you in that regard. Um, and you know, kinship not only means relatives when it comes to foster care, it means close members of the family even teachers. So Keisha, there might be a, a, a close member of your family, somebody you're very, very close to who might be able to help you with that. Jen, have you ever done any type of kinship care at all? No, Jeffrey's case wasn't considered kinship, even though we had already adopted Caden, which is his brother. Um, so no. Okay. All right. Uh, Heather says, thanks so much. Uh, yes, they both tested positive for multiple legal drugs. Luckily, he was only a few days premature, but very tiny. You know, I, the, uh, I, I picked up my daughter, Grace, from soccer practice today. She came to us when she was five days old. She was five point, I think 5.2 pounds. I remember her fitting in my hand at the uh, caseworker, at the agency where we picked her up. I, this is when I was still teaching high school. I left school. Uh, and my wife said, meet me at the, the agency. So we did there. They put a baby in my hand. They said, will you take her home with you? And I thought, uh, <laughs> this was right before Christmas. And uh, we took that 5.2 pound baby to a Christmas party at our church that night. Um, it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, when you're a foster parent, you know, sometimes it's just crazy. Um, that was, that was, um, I've had a few little tiny babies in my house. Um, you know, I think I, 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 I documented how many diapers I changed over the years, and I was very disappointed and startled by the thousands that I had done over the years. Uh, Phoebe Cass says, I appreciate you both. What a wonderful way to wrap the day up. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Heather says, oh, he weighed five pounds, five ounces. Hey, Jennifer, you had, um, you had a child of your own, um, your daughter, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. How, how much did she weigh when she was born? She was six pounds, I think six pounds, eight ounces. So my first three children were girls. My our first one died, fortunately, but the second two were girls. And my wife and I never found out what the sex of the child was, all right? My wife would say, it's like opening up a present before Christmas, she didn't want the surprise. So when our second child was born, I didn't ask if the child what the child's sex was. I asked, is it healthy? Does it have two legs, two arms? Does it have a brain? Because our baby had acephaly. And I did that for all the children. And for my son, um, the doctor said, uh, you know, I asked the questions. This is after I had fainted. I think because the doctor said, hey, hold your wife's leg, hold your leg, hold her leg. I said, no, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't. The doctor put her leg in my hand. I saw some things I never wanted to see, and I fainted data away. So they got me up. And then they, uh, they said, finally, um, you have a boy. You have a boy. John, you have a boy. Yes. And I said, I, 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 don't, I don't do boys. I, have three, I had three girls. So I don't <laughs> do boys. And I was in shock. And then I said, but how do they go to the bathroom? Because I was used to two girls, you know, in the, in toilet, trying to toilet train, potty train girls. So I was not really thinking. Um, 
Yeah. All right. Crazy birth stories there. Hey, the answer is you potty train them the same way you potty train girls. If anybody yeah, is curious, yeah. I found they that sit on the cool. toilet until they learn that, and then you teach them how to stand. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hey, I want to say hello to Mike. I see Mike is here tonight, and Amy's here. Welcome, Amy. This is Foster Talk with Dr. John and Jen Lilly, our special guests here. We had so much fun last Tuesday night, and so many of you emailed me and messaged me and texted me and said she must come back on again. So I was able to get her on before she starts a. Another great. That's just because uh, I make them feel normal because I have the same questions. You have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to hear what your questions are tonight. We're here for a little bit longer. What are you struggling with tonight? Whether it's parenting, kinship, adoption, foster care. You want to hear about Jen's lifestyle as a foster adoptive parent while doing movies, or you want to hear a little bit about my lifestyle? We'd love to hear and answer your questions. So glad you're here with us tonight. Jen, have you ever done this? Have you ever done this? And you've held your hands out like this. And you said, right there, right there. I was at a, I was at a, at a, um, at a, uh, our mayor's house, beautiful white carpet. And my second daughter got sick and oh. I could see it coming. So I did this, no, right there, right there. Cause I did not want my daughter's vomit on the white carpet. Have you had that experience as a mom yet? <laughs> yes. Oh. And I will say, okay, so here's, it's a funny story. Okay. So here, Caden, we had Caden. Caden's my adopted son. He's four through foster care. He was supposed to be with us for three weeks or so. We're so happy that we adopted him. But like, I, you know, he's my first baby. He was my first foster care case. And again, I thought it was like three weeks, something I was doing over hiatus while I was still doing the soap opera. You know, it was like, I was, I had not signed up for this. So he got super sick and he had uh, like, uh, he had the diarrhea and, and I'm trying to think what all of it was. Okay. So first of all, he was vomiting like every hour and a half. He would vomit. Oh my gosh. I would hear him vomit. I would hear him vomit in the um, pack and play, right? Cause he was an infant. So he slept in like a little pack and play in our room. Cause again, I thought it was three weeks. This is like three months in. He would vomit and I would jump out of my side of the bed, get him from the pack and play. Vomit two would be on me. Vomit four. three would be right before I got to the bathroom and vomit four would be me putting him over the tub because he was like, I don't know, six, seven months old, you know, like couldn't vomit in the toilet. So I just held him over the, you know, the, the bathtub. And I remember my friend Ashley was staying with us and she was a pediatric nurse. So she was like, look, you need to give him tiny sips of whatever at a time. So this went on for like three or four hours and I was like, okay, I think I need to send him to the hospital now because he is not. So it was like this time it was vomit number one, you know, like in the crib, vomit number two on me. And I'm not showering and like I'm fully like a, a known TV person at this time. I've got vomit all over me. I've got vomit in my hair. I've got vomit all over oh. the floor. And the fourth time it was like, I'm running to the bathroom and he had diarrhea that had so oh. much mucus in it. And I had, I was holding him and I felt it hit the palm of my hand, even though he had a diaper on. It felt like when you punch yourself like this, the weight of it, I was like, I gotta take this kid to the ER. And they ended up just giving him like some fluids and they were, they wanted him and they were like, we don't know, it's just a bug. But I remember when I'm covered in vomit and I go to LA Children's Hospital, I am covered in vomit like people are fully recognizing me <laughs> covered in vomit hair vomit baby in vomit you know like just trying to and i remember sitting on my bathroom floor and i said to jason i said well you know in james 127 where it says pure religion before the lord is this taking care of widows and orphans in their distress i said I have earned some crowns in heaven. This is not what I signed up for. That was the moment where I was like, okay, Gaden, you're officially my child. And if I don't adopt you, like you have christened me into motherhood. So, oh, <laughs> Jeff friend. was polite. He waited till like four. Jeff waited like, I don't know, at least six months before he threw up all over me. You know, different than spit up. Like we're talking vomit, oh. vomit. Um, he was pulling, vomit, vomit. So those of you watching, those of you watching, the next time you watch Jen on a Hallmark Channel movie, I want you to picture that as she's with some guy in a ski slope or or sitting across a at a coffee table. Because I've recognized there are a number of things that happen in the Hallmark movie. Because I've gone back and done my 
research yeah. engine. They're at a coffee shop or they're in a school. So whatever it might be, think about that. Keep that story in mind. Uh, Phoebe, said, Phoebe says, what a wonderful woman you are. Um, that was my favorite verse, someone says. All right, Ivy says, I have a, and I'm going to keep that in mind too. Um, mm, I haven't had that much. You're the winner there. <laughs> You're the winner. You are the vomit expert. Okay. I have a kinship placement. We have corn a few weeks, bio dad, fighting for custody, and lives out of state. Caseworkers told us judge will most likely make a decision that day if she goes with him. How much time does a judge normally give to get kiddos things together? Well, um, Ivy, Again, when it comes to COVID, all this has changed because right now a lot of agencies are giving their birth parents additional time because a birth parent can say this. They can argue, they can make the argument, make the claim that they're not getting the time to do the parenting classes because of isolation, because of being isolated, because of being away from, you know, the resources that they can get because of social distancing, because of COVID. So as a result, it's me, sorry, because there's so many classes online, but anyway. Right, right. So as a result, many uh, reunification processes are taking longer. Adoption processes are being stalled as a result because, again, those biological parents can make that claim that I couldn't get the support services and the training I needed because, uh, because of COVID. So, Ivy, unfortunately, the number I would give you last February is going to be very different than the number I give you. A year later um, because right now again agencies and court systems are understaffed they're scrambling to make things happen so judge is going to look at it very differently now than they did a year ago but wouldn't you say dr. John that if the judge were to rule in the father's favor you may have not even 30 minutes notice to pack up the child's stuff well if you if you, if you saw my TED talk I had 22 hours right for a child that we were planning on adopting and um, yeah. you know, it's, and, th and this is, and this is 14 years later, and it still stings me. It still stings me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Jane says, uh, and Jen, you can answer to this. Jane says, I heard there are over 60,000 kids in foster care in California. I don't know California's numbers. Jen, can you talk about that? Um, I don't know that it's 60,000, but that sounds about right, because I know LA has the most in the United States, making up about 10% of the United States cases with around 38,000. So I do believe that 60,000 is accurate for California. Yes, they have a lot of problems there. And uh, I think that's for a lot of reasons. One, there's a lot of population there, but also, the, uh, especially in LA, you know, it's no surprise that most people are chasing the uh, vanity dream of being famous or, you know, having a job like mine. So in that job, you know, work is literally your life. And if you're going to be successful, you have no time for children unless you carve out time. Um, so most people are just stuck in their own vanity and they really don't care about anything but their career. And so, you know, the aftermath of that is that you're going to have a lot of kids that don't have homes and there's no homes for them to go to because families aren't really prevalent in LA anyway. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right about Los Angeles. Los Angeles is struggling in so many areas. And as Jen just rightfully pointed out, 10% of America's kids in the foster system, we have roughly 430,000 right now. Um, and that's important to note that that number has dropped due to COVID, some of it's due to COVID. Also, President Trump was very, very uh, active in getting children adopted. You know, that was something that they really focused upon. So more children were adopted the last couple of years to take them yeah. to the foster care system. More children found for our families. But Los Angeles is struggling right now. Ivy says, thank you very much for your input. Ivy, thank you for joining us. I appreciate that. You know, Jen, you talked about that, that chasing the dream in Los Angeles. It's been, it's been... Gosh, it has been, I want to say, 20 years since I've been to Los Angeles. Um, my wife was there recently, my daughter, my daughters. No, uh, is, is, is there a lot of homelessness in Los Angeles? Oh, right. yeah, huge, huge. And it's only gotten worse. You know, in my, all I really know about that is that one, um, well, you know, California does a lot of things backwards. And, um, and they also ship buses of homeless people to LA because you know it is much easier to be homeless in LA in the sense of climate. Um, 
but I think a lot of that also comes from the fact that Dr. John, you know, and a lot of your, you know, people tuning in would know that, um, you know, there's a huge correlation between foster care and homelessness. Uh, about 50% of our homeless in the United States came from foster right. care. And so obviously, if you have the highest amount of children in foster care that don't have placements, 38,000 in LA, then of course, your homeless numbers are going to be astronomical right. as well. Right, right. And there's also a problem with human trafficking in Los Angeles as well, too, right? Of course, because it's a port city. And, um, you know, there's industry for it there. So, right, right. Uh, Sadie says is and Sadie, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Foster talk with Dr. John and Dr. Jen. Is Pennsylvania the least amount that have in foster care? Um, Sadie, I'm not quite sure. I don't know the specific numbers of Pennsylvania. I've had the pleasure of working in Pennsylvania so many times through the years uh, with agencies there and nonprofits and some great faith-based organizations there, but I don't know specifically the number of children in foster care in Pennsylvania. You know, it's something to, to it's important to recognize that the numbers of kids in the foster care fluctuate every day because children are constantly placed in the foster care every day and children are aging out of the system every day as well. It's something that, um, that's near and dear to my heart. I know Jen's heart as well. Those youth who age out of foster care who are never adopted, the statistics are very, very grim. The number that drop out of school, the number that become homeless, the number that end up incarcerated, the number who their, their children become children of foster care as well, it passes on to the next generation. Um, so you have children being adopted, you have children aging out of foster care and children entering into foster care. So it's an ever changing number. Yeah. yeah. And I don't uh, think you should be scared of TAYS, which are transitional age youth, you know, the, the at high, high risk ones. Um, I think, you know, teenagers are probably scary to everybody. I know I'm afraid of that those years, you know, I'm trying my best as a mom of toddlers to get them under control now, but um, at the same time, I have heard so many incredible stories about transition age youth and my husband and I actually hosted one during COVID and she's incredible. She just got into UCLA's nursing program. Well, she's doing very, very well. And um, so, you know, you don't have to necessarily be afraid um, of transitional age youth thinking, oh, they're criminals, you know, whatever. A lot of times they become criminals because nobody does help That's them good. transition and they and they're afraid and they they um, they feel like at least in jail, they're going to have a hot in the cot, which is horrible. Um, and so, you know, you may be the changing. You may be the person that changes the trajectory of their entire life. And I would just say, use discernment. You know, God is if you believe in God, I hope you do. Um, he is faithful to give you discernment and you and your spouse or you and whoever uh, or just you alone pray about it and yeah, I really think that God will lead you on what's right to do for you and your family, because it may not always be a good idea to host a transition age youth, um, depending on what your own family dynamic is. But I would say, please don't be afraid of uh, transition age youth in general. They're pretty amazing. You know, I echo what you say there. Um, when, when we have a phone call, it's always prayer first. And then we ask those questions. Can we provide what the child needs at this time in our home? Is our home at this time a good fit for this child? Is this child a good time for our home at this time? So, you know, you've got to ask those questions because it's not always a yes. You know, I have right. a hard time saying no, but there are times when we do need to say no to the placement because we might not be the best placement for that child. We might not be able to offer the support services they need. Um, our family might not be a good fit for that child and vice versa. I know it's hard for both parents to say no, but when we say no to the child, we're saying yes to another child, and, we, and we're also saying yeah, uh, out giving a child an opportunity to go to a family that can provide the needs that they have. Heather says, oh, well, that's there. What happened there? Um, I don't want that. All right. My computer is doing silly stuff there. Are you still there, Jen? Okay, there we go. All right. Heather says, what if bio dad is in, is in a court-ordered rehab? What happens if he decides he wants to be in a baby's life? Heather, again, it really depends upon how the judge sees that. Um, we have to remember the end goal of foster care is always reunification, so that is something that's going to be prominent if it is in the best interest of the child. Now, at the same time, I'm a big firm believer, and I know Jen is as well, of co-parenting, of helping those birth parents, um, even if they can't get their child back. Even if termination of parental rights happens, I want to 
try to help those birth parents heal, uh, overcome their challenges, um, get the help they need. You know, two of the three I've adopted, Jim, you know this, two of the three I've adopted are third generation foster care, which means their parents and grandparents were also in foster care and the system failed them. I need to stop that. And we want to stop that for all of them. So many of those birth parents, like that birth, that bio dad of yours, Heather, that bio dad is probably suffering from some trauma he never had help. He never got the help he needed. So if you can somehow come alongside him, at least support him or encourage him or be a person of prayer to pray for him, not only is it going to help the baby, it's going to help that father as well. Or maybe he may have future children as well. Jen, how do you feel about that? I 100% agree. I mean, that was the case with Caden, and we were really rooting for his dad, you know, and um, it was scary and uncomfortable to root for his dad, and I have never been in prayer so much, but, um, you know, obviously he didn't, he didn't reunify, um, and that was definitely in Caden's best interest, but I think it's so helpful to, what, exactly what you said, remember that a lot of times these bio parents more times than not also came from foster care or from absolute brokenness. And, um, you know, you're rooting for them to heal. You just have to root for them to heal. Hope that what, what that leads to is if, if reunification happens and, and it was premature, sometimes you being that support system will also ensure that the child returns to you should that child end up back in foster care which is very helpful the parent will make a request that was the case with uh jeffrey their mom their birth mom the boy share birth mom she requested that jeffrey be put with us um because she had a positive relationship right. with us um but i think at the same time when you come alongside them too it can help you um see what's really going on notice red flags of um i don't know addiction slipping back right. in and i just think it's in the best interest of the child and that birth family to come alongside them and root for them and also closeness can help the child in the long run too amen amen you know you mentioned something that reminded me we have uh, several times we've had people who have had children placed in foster care in our county and they have told the caseworker can my kids please go to the degarmos because they have seen their friends' children placed in their home as well. So they know it's gonna be a safe, stable home. We're gonna to get to Ashley and Missy in just a minute. Appreciate you guys being here. Jen, I wanna ask you a question. In all of your experiences on TV and movies, Hallmark, Days of Our Lives, General Hospital, were there any, was there any instance, and I'm asking because I just don't know, was there any instance that and it all repaired you for foster care. Were there any times where there was anything related to foster care or adoption or kinship care or child abuse? Do you ever have any storylines, if you will? Um, unfortunately, no, um, <laughs> no. And I, I have, I have wanted to do that. And producers talk to me about that all the time. And I'm like, yes, let's make it happen. Um, no, not yet, but I, of course, have been able to use a lot of the emotion and experiences I've experienced as a parent and as a foster parent to really help me, you know, on soaps, you get one take, it's pretty much almost live. Um, and so if you can't get to those tears immediately, even if you're not feeling it, you better be feeling it. And so there's a lot of raw emotions that have come from foster care that I've used in scenes. So it's been helpful for me as an actor. And all of you who are my age or older, who are products of the late 60s, early 70s, uh, I found this out last week. Jen was in a movie with my childhood. I had this, you probably did two people. No. <laughs> I had in 1974, this is well before Jen was born, I had a $6 million man and a bionic woman doll. And Jen was in a movie with them. And I thought that was the neatest thing I heard in a long time. You know, what's more neat than that is the fact that Lindsay Wagner, who obviously is the bionic woman, she's a huge advocate against child abuse. And she sits on the board of the Interagency Council Against Child Abuse and Neglect and brought me on that board. And she is a warrior for children. So she's also a huge advocate and fan of foster care and, and child abuse uh, prevention, I think you know, interaction. We have a discussion to talk about later on then. <laughs> uh, I want to know more about that. All right, Ashley says, how do you suggest helping a young child when we hear them being with us for the foreseeable future and they think they might go home soon? Jen, how would you have that conversation with that child? 
how old is the child? It just says young child. Just says young child. Young child. Yeah. I mean, I would try to prepare the child as best I can and say that, uh, I, you know, I don't, not knowing the specifics of the case, I would privately ask the social worker and or the judge or the child's lawyer and the child's birth parents or whoever the child's reunifying with, um, if you could stay in touch. You don't always get a, a yes, and a lot of times you get a no, but it never hurts to ask. So I would first ask privately them and really advocate for uh, weaning that child off of you, you know, trying to tell the parents that you'll be a support. Um, but then with the child's discussion, I would just keep telling them that you love them and um, that we are all, I would make it inclusive, we are all the social worker, the, your mom or dad, whoever the parent is, grandparent, whoever, and myself, you know, the foster parent. We love you so much. Right. And we all want what's best for you. And you're going to be okay. And I'm going to be thinking of you every day. Right. And, um, and how, you know, I you just, to us, just well, tell them they're smart right. and they're amazing. They're, they're, they're created on purpose and for a purpose. Um, that you're going to think about them every day right. and just that they're going to be safe. And if they don't feel safe, you know, I would give them your number. And like, maybe John, you don't agree with that, but sometimes I think I know. that I've had mentors, mentees before where I've made them memorize my phone number. And I've said, look, if you feel unsafe and I mean unsafe, unsafe, you need to ask the teacher if you can go use the school office phone and you call me and here's my number you know 818 blah 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 blah, and make them know that number or put that number in their bag show them where you're putting it hide it if you have to and just say you can call me and i will make sure that you are safe if you don't feel safe and sometimes that if that child calls you you know then i would call the social worker and just be like here's what's going on you know whatever because sometimes the ch child might just miss you but i think more times than not if they're going to actually call you some you, they need an advocate right. what do you think dr john is that bad advice? no when a child leaves our home jen we give them a, we give them an eight by ten frame picture of our family with a child in it and in the back of that is our names our address and our phone number eight six seven five three oh nine um and yeah right because that you don't know when they need to call and and I think and I they told, don't know how to call you. Right. And I think Jen and I may have told you the story, but four years after the child left their home, this is my Sydney for my TED Talk. Her name's Change of Course. And she called me up and she said, Daddy, I want to come home. And I said, Where is this you? Where are you? Where you? And, uh, she had the opportunity to call me. She said, Daddy, I want to come home. I want to come home with tears. I can hear the tears. I said, Where are you? Yeah. Where are you? It was so hard. But at least she had the opportunity to do that. Um, Nikki says that her daughter was named after Lindsay Wagner, the fine woman. <laughs> All right. Um, Caitlin says, my two-year-old foster twins have an eight-year-old sister who was placed separately. Connie wanted her to learn how to be a kid, not a care and not a caretaker, since she was only one tending to the twins. I do not believe her foster mom was pre-adopted, and we are. If Reunification does not happen. Is it likely they will ask us to adopt the eight-year-old sister as well? Caitlin, it's very likely that they will. They want to keep those siblings together. Jen has adopted two that are biologically related. I have adopted two that are biologically related. Yes, most times you will have that opportunity. Not always, because there's always exceptions to the rules. Most likely that, that can happen, yeah. Um, Jen, did did you, when, when your youngest was placed with you to adopt, well, when he was initially placed with you, did you expect adoption to occur right away? Did you know this was going to happen? Yeah. With Jeff? Yeah. Caden's younger brother? Um, I, I, I was a lot less stressed out about that case. It was less stressful anyway, just because they have different dads and the situation was different. Right. Um, but I... I pretty much anticipated adoption happening. I know there, but it was a different, you know, every case is different. And I also know that their mom had considered Carol, in January up. before she had him in March. And she wanted us to adopt him from the get go and had regretted not calling us before the services got involved. So I kind of assumed it may go to adoption, but I also felt comfortable enough that had it gone to reunification, 
I would have been able to have a relationship with him. Right. So. Right. Listen, we've got a couple more minutes here. This is Foster Talk with Dr. John and superstar, celebrity actress, amazing makeup foster doctor mom, Jen Lilly, answering your questions. Um, we'll get a couple more questions. And Missy says, we're, and, and so if you have questions, just type away. Let us know what you want. Anything we will answer, anything you want. Missy says, we're doing kinship of my cousin's one-year-old son. We have had him almost three months now. His parents are not doing what they were ordered to. Mom even missed two court appointments in a scheduled video visit. Judge told them to prepare for TPR and possible adoption at next hearing. If they don't, what she would do what she was ordered to. Uh, I was allowing open video visitations since we got them. They sometimes go over a week. Let's see. I'm gonna be, um, let's see. The question is this. I'm very concerned about the risk of infection if they're going to ask in person because of COVID. Mom got super angry and kind of ugly response. What is your advice on what is best for the baby? You asking, that's a tough question there. You need to make sure that you do what you feel is comfortable. You need to do what you feel is best interest of the child. You need to do what you think is best protecting this child. If you're concerned about COVID, you need to make that known to the caseworker. Right. You need to make where your concerns are. And if you feel uncomfortable about this, document that and let them know that. Would you agree, Jen? Yeah. I mean, you know, each person has to do whatever they need for COVID. Right. right. That's okay. personal. I think that's a personal. This is a question for Jen. Sarah says, best advice for a newer foster parent. I fostered for a year. I've only had four. I still have lots to learn. Jen, what would the best advice you'd give to a new foster parent? <laughs> I feel like I'm also kind of a new foster parent. So, um, you know, so I, I don't know. I guess I would say my, my biggest advice is to find community. Um, and I think the way that you do that is through, for me, it's especially during COVID times, it's been through Instagram. So I follow the hashtag, sorry, I was checking on some potatoes, I'm boiling. Um, <laughs> I, I follow the hashtag get to attached and hashtag um, foster love. And just that way, it's easy for me to find other foster parents who are like-minded, who have the same kind of heart in, that's in the right place for kids in foster care. And obviously with COVID, it's like, you know, it's an online community. And I think that for me, that's kind of what kept me going in foster care. I found uh, Brittany Ray Stokes, who's the founder of Project Orphans, and she's incredible. And I found her through a hashtag. And it was like, I, I was literally straw on the camel's back thinking with Caden, like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I can't do social media anymore. I can't do foster yeah. parenting anymore. And I found Brittany and I just felt so encouraged. And that's what- And I would encourage- so. Find community. People, I would encourage people, if they're not familiar with this, Jen's got a fantastic podcast. Um, I've been on it twice. I loved it. I'd love to come back. It's called Fostering Hope. It's a great podcast for foster parents. Jen's got a lot of variety of, of guests on there. So much to learn from. Um, so I would encourage anybody to check out that podcast as well. Uh, Sarah says, one of my fa foster babies, foster mom posts nudes and doing drugs on her social media. She has over a thousand. Screen cap it. Screen cap it. She, has, it she has over a thousand followers. She'll post a picture here and there of my foster baby. I'm concerned about this picture being in the mix of all the nudes and drugs. Should I bring yeah. it up to the worker or attorney or just let it go? Yeah. Nope. Don't, don't let it go. Sarah. Screen you cap all of it. You send that to the lawyer. You send that to the caseworker. You document it if you, uh, you know, and another thing I would do right now is I would create a, what's called a catfish account. It's a fake account, so it's not yours. Um, you create a fake social media account because right now her profile is public and you start following her because if she decides to make it private, which she probably will when the social worker or lawyer asks about it or it's presented at the next trial, she's going to make her account private which means you would no longer have access. So you need to create a fake social media account, follow her right now, start screen capping everything. Um, I did that with Caden's dad. I, I screen capped every single post all the way back from like 2012 when he first started you know, using Instagram. And I was smart to do it because I put all of those in a folder and after it was brought up about three times, he wiped and archived his entire social media so you could never find those posts again. And I still had the hard copy evidence and so did the court. And why that's so important, not only for obvious reasons, you obviously know because you've asked, but that child is being exploited as well. And should that child face family reunification, 
it is more likely than not that child is also going to be sexually exploited and trafficked. So it's a really big um, red flag. You obviously know that, but that's my huge advice. Bring it to every single person's attention um, and, and privately. Bring it to the social media, I mean, not social media, it's the social worker's attention. Bring it to the guardian at litem or the child's attorney's attention. Um, I would do it in email so that there is a paper Absolutely. trail. Um, but that way they have it in their files and it's not something that you are presenting in court saying this is from me. Um, also, you know, with Caden Social Worker, when I did that, you know, it was from a catfish account. And I would, when I would provide the files, I would black out, I would put like a black line over my fake profile so that his dad could not figure out which one of my followers is turning this information in. So you have to be really smart about it. It's a little annoying. It is time consuming, but you are most definitely saving that child's life from being exploited and trafficked. So definitely do that. I agree 100% and I've been there as well. I, I have printed out 13 pages of, of information that, um, that mom posted on her, on her uh, social media sites and I gave it to the judge and the judge said, um, well, we're done here. And uh, I, re I recall pretty much running out of that courtroom because the mother and the father were coming after me. No one was happy. Uh, that was no one knew that I did it. Oh, yeah. So no one on the case, they couldn't figure out. They thought it was the social worker doing it in my case. Yeah, um, that was a little bit different. Um, uh, it was a court hearing and we had five of these kids. These, 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 you know the story, this is the children that were five and they went, yeah, you know that story. So when they came back, um, uh, the, 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 the mom went on the stand and she fabricated a whole bunch of uh, false information about herself. She told the judge that it wasn't feces in the floor, it was chocolate in the floor covered in dust. Da, 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 da. And the judge asked me, Dr. Jones, is there anything you want to say? Because he had known me, we worked together a lot. And I got up there and said, sir, I want you to see this. And I gave him those pages of the social media sites and it was filled with filth. And he could see very quickly, this is a very yeah. unstable environment. This is an environment of harm. There's no structure here. In fact, it's a dangerous environment. And um, there's a gamble that I took, but at the same time, I knew yes. if I don't do this, these children could be placed back in their environment. And, and so, yeah. Sarah says- I would also say quickly on that, John, I would also say, uh, Dr. John, I would also say to this foster mom that's asking, in the interim, you know, first things first, create, first things first, I would go in and before you even create the catfish account, um, I would start screen capping every single one. So you have it in case something happens. Then I would create the catfish account and do that. And then during your visits, even if they're, um, you know, remote, I would just start really pouring into that mom and just showing her a lot of grace and kindness because she obviously came from brokenness and doesn't know her worth. And uh, while it's not in the best interest of this baby, it's the same thing I say about my boy's mom. You know, I think one day she will make a great mom. Right. So, right. you know, she just, she needs a lot of love and she needs a lot of work to do, but that doesn't mean she can't turn it around and be a great mom in the future. So I would also really encourage uh, you to Sarah work on her. Uh, so helpful thank you so much uh and she says she has a fake account to follow she says she uses a fake account to follow so that's thank you so Marty much. Pants. Yeah. yeah yep we may have jen do you have time for maybe one more question one or two more questions here great 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 all right and i've got to go home and get ready to pack because you know i'm leaving tomorrow so i gotta get ready yes. for that. it's my wife's 50th birthday coming up people and uh and we are leaving tomorrow, and I'm trying to get my older kids. They're, my, uh, my three children from college are coming home, and they're trying to figure out what day, who's going to pick up the children from school this day, who's going to pick up the kids from soccer this day, who's going to take them here. And my wife and I are like, figure that out on your own. Don't involve us. We're getting ready to pack. So, all right, er, Emmy said, I hope I pronounce it right, Emmy, and thank you for joining us. Emmy says, we are called by our agency to accept the newborn sibling to adopt the children in October. Somewhere along the line, they changed their minds, claiming it's too many kids in our home. We have five kids and are licensed for six. Everyone is a little dumbfounded in the situation. We're not giving up. We filed an appeal and now thankfully have an amazing judge overseeing the case, trying to place the siblings with us. It's such a hard pill to swallow. That's what's best for the kids hasn't been the main focus here. Have you dealt with issues like this? We are so deflated in the system lately, although thankful for all the workers who've been helping along the way. 
I have been there. I mean, I've been there too many times. I have been there too many times. I mean, I have been the foster parent who has called up my caseworker and said, what are you doing? This is not in the best interest of the child. I have been told that I'm too emotionally involved in the children. I've been told I'm too invested in the children. I am told I know I need to love the children less, which I'm completely against all of that. Because if you don't invest yourself emotionally in these children, the children know that and you're hurting those children. So unfortunately, I've been there. Uh, I would continue, I would encourage you to continue doing what you think is best. Um, don't be afraid to be their advocate. Um, and I want to say thank you for loving these children. Now, yes, for many state levels, the number is six. I've had as many as 11 people say, how is that? Because there's not enough homes in our area. So I would say continue to let the caseworker know, show them that you are the, you are the best home for these children. Um, but Jen, how do you feel about that? Um, becoming emotionally involved with these children, invested in them? I think, um, not to plug myself, but to, it's, it's not a plug for myself. It's a way for you to um, know that I've been through this exact situation and relate. And uh, you should go to my Instagram after this. It's Jen, J-E-N underscore Lily, L-I-L-L-E-Y. I run the account myself, but I just posted a video about Jeffrey's adoption. Um, you'll see it, it's like three posts down and it's incredible. And I went through this with Jeffrey as well, where they didn't want to place him with us. And you know, the mom, their birth mom wanted him placed with us. I wanted him placed with us. You know, I've been there emotionally, like I'm about to cry about it now. I would say to you that I, um, you know, if it's not evident, I am a Christian and I believe in the power of prayer and obviously I recognize that not everybody shares faith or has faith at all, but obviously because I'm a Christian, I hope that you would be a Christian too. And if you are, I will say that you need to be encouraged, stand in your faith and know that you are a ruler and reigner spiritually and that you need to take authority over that situation. You have the authority in prayer to speak that child into your family. And I am not joking. That is what I did with Jeff. I prayed a prayer when they told me that he was not going to be in my house. I remember being so concerned. Luckily, I found out that Jeff did come from a home where he was well cared for. That poor foster mom like packed his, all of his stuff was came clean. He came clean. He came packed in a nice bag. He came with a little note. You know, I know that that mom cried when they took Jeff and placed him with us. So I was so grateful that he was in a good foster home. But I remember praying, not knowing what kind of foster home he was in. And I was like, yelling in my car. I was like driving and praying in my car, which I do a lot, which is probably dangerous. But I remember it just was like, I got the call. I didn't have time. I was like, I am praying down this 170 freeway. And I remember saying like, and if they, you know, speaking of the other foster parent, if they, if they mean to hate on him, you know, if they hate him, any abuse would come out as love. Like I speak love over this child. I speak the blood of Jesus over this child. I speak authority and protection over this child. You know, no weapon fashioned against me is pro will prosper. I speak life over this child. I speak, you know, angels around this child, warring angels around this child. I thank you that he is mine in Jesus name. Um, I think that you've created him on purpose and for a purpose for great plans. And I just, you know, know that your word says God that your word will not return void, that we are rulers and reigners with Christ. I speak authority over the situation in Jesus name that this child would come into my household. And I am not kidding before I parked the car and my husband was saying like, no, we're not taking this child. I was leaving for a movie the next day. He was like, I cannot take two. I work night shift. There is no way I can handle two babies. Like you're leaving to go shoot a movie. Are you crazy? And I was like, you need to go pray about this. And I don't think that you should speak to your husband like that. But I was like, I love you. You are letting fear dictate this decision. You go pray. I'm going to pray. Call me back. <laughs> Call me back. He's like, we have to take this child. And I'm like, so be it. And then I get another phone call and it's the social worker being like, yeah, we decided to move him with you. So, I mean, sometimes like things move that fast. And I think that, you know, when you pray things in faith, I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus and you're listening to this and you're like, well, I need some of that. Yeah, you do. Like Jesus is amazing. The Bible is true. I am clearly like a crazy Christian, but I have seen him make God work. I have seen God work. I have seen miracles in my life. I have seen cancer leave people's body. I am telling you, Jesus is alive and well, and you have authority in your prayer. So I would encourage you to seek Jesus if you haven't already. And if you're a Christian, you just start praying, Mama. I 100%. Listen, I wrote the book, Faith and Foster. A lot of stories in that book. Jen, there's a copy of the mail going to you. 
a lot of copies, a lot of stories in the book for how my wife and I have um, been foster parents and people of faith at the same time and how we're always praying for these kids. And then listen, there have been times where I've been, my stomach has been in knots at nighttime and I have known no peace because I know these kids are going back to this environment. And the only time I get the peace is through prayer. So absolutely right. Um, um, uh, Jennifer says, uh, Je Jennethy, uh, Jamethy. I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing that name wrong. I'm sorry. Beautiful Jen. Yes, the Lord will make way when there seems no way. Our children left us, but through tears, we know and believe we were there to plant those seeds. That's absolutely right. And I'm a yeah. firm believer of Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked, you gave me clothing. To me, that's these children. That's these children, and we're caring yeah. for God's children in Christ. Uh, Jenny has and there is peace that. that comes in knowing that God, that's the only oh, way yeah. I've gotten through foster care. I don't know how, but yeah. somebody does foster care right. without Jesus. And right. that's me biased. I'm totally biased. But for me, man, just knowing that God loves these children more than I do is one of the only things that has gotten me through sitting through those painful court cases being like, yeah. I don't have the authority to speak and I want to speak and I can't. And I just have to know that God is speaking the on last my behalf. Last time we had 11, I remember it was, I think it was month four of 11, and I was in the shower, and I thought, I'm just so, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore, God. I'm so tired. I rely upon you. I lean upon your rock. I'm completely throwing myself upon you, God. Take my yoke, um, because mine is heavy. So, amen and amen. Listen, we're about out of time here. It is Australia Day today. And if you don't know, Jen has a new record that came out. A new record. And that record is called Your Album. Oh, me, mine. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Australia Day. I was like, what? Um, it's called, uh, no, it's called Hindsight. Right, Hindsight. So Jen has graciously agreed because she is a recording star. She is going to sing for all of us the Australian National Anthem. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, because I don't even know how it goes. So, uh, um, you know, I hate to admit that I forget how it goes right now myself. I just bring it in this. Yeah, I know, oh. I know, I know, I know. Um, James is hardest on this. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, Sarah says, I love the saying, fostering and love for their today and praying for God for their tomorrow. That's fantastic, Sarah. Jamie says, hardest but most spiritually refining indeed. Yeah, to me, it's been the most, and you've heard me say this, Jen, it's the hardest thing I've done. But at the same time, it's been the re most rewarding thing I've done. Every child has come through my home has made me a better person. And I think every child that's come through my home has been placed through God. These are members of my family, um, and I'm grateful for every child that's come through my home. Are there times where I pulled out my hair and thought, this ch child is driving me crazy? Oh, yeah. Yes. I did. I was like, oh, yeah. Right. All right. Oh, that's, awesome. that's right. I had that moment. Is she still in there? Colby, you there? Yeah, she's right there. My 23 year old's right there. I had that moment with her about an hour ago. Um, you know, pull my hair out. I just keep thinking this child's been placed in my care for a reason. Somehow God thinks I can do this. <laughs> Even with my biological daughter, I'm afraid of her sometimes, you know, she's one and a half and I see the feistiness that I have in her and I'm like, oh God, how am I going to steer this <laughs> oh, in the well, right direction? <laughs> the last question here, Ronnie says, Ronnie says, have you ever had a social worker that did not like you for some reason? Uh, Ronnie, we talked yeah. about this last week with Jen. I talked about one who caseworker who actually said to me, Dr. John, I don't do humor because I'm always pulling jokes. Yeah, I've been there. I've had a caseworker who, um, yes, I've heard a caseworker tell me I was too judgmental because it, the, the, the birth parents were still on drugs uh, and they wanted the child wanted to go back to the, the home. Yes, I've been there. I've had that. Jen, have you had that? I can't imagine you have. I have. And Oh. I, I have, and I think that um, one way that you can get around that is um, take a breath, you know, and next time you interact with a social worker, whether it's through email or phone, it's easier to do over email. Just say, you know, hey, how can I help you? Um, and, and when they realize that you're trying to work with them, and or you know, I always start thanking my social workers, like, thank you so much. I know you have a really right. thankless job. Right. If, if there's anything that I can do to help you, let me know. Um, fill out your reports, turn them in on time. Just keep being consistent and keep being grateful. And sometimes that's enough to melt their right. ice. <laughs>
And, and as I mentioned earlier, caseworkers today are overworked, overwhelmed, under-resourced, under-supported, underpaid. Ab- underpaid, absolutely. I always say that one for last. And because of COVID, it's even harder for them. Uh, theirs is a job where everybody's mad at them. The foster parent, the birth parents may be mad at them. The foster parents may be mad at them. The birth, the, the kids may be mad at them. Their own family might be mad at them because they're spending so much time on, uh, with the cases. Mm-hmm. It's a thankless yeah. job, and they have emotions just like you and I. And many times they don't agree with the decisions of the court as well, but they're powerless to counter yes. it. So yes, they're frustrated. They're it's a hard job, and like Jen said, I I am so grateful for them. I thank them as often as I can. I call them up. And encourage them. We'll give them gifts, gift cards. Um, treat them like friends. Treat them like friends um, because they need that. They need someone to recognize what they're doing is hard but important. I myself don't know that I could do that job. It's a thankless job. So we have to remember that. You know, we've got a webinar here at the foster parent, the foster parents do uh, caseworkers and foster parents working together. So I would encourage you to check that out there. Ronnie says, "Thank you guys for speaking about this. I need to hear this so bad. We were the one on the verge of giving up." Well, I'm glad that we're able to help you. Too. Yeah. Hey, I want to thank Jen. I want to thank our special co-host tonight, Jen Lilly. She is in Canada tonight, where she's getting ready to do um, to do a new film. Jen, can you tell us a little bit about that or not? Yeah, sure. Um, the new film right now, working title is Love Is Trending. By the way, I have a movie coming out on Hallmark this Saturday. If you don't get Hallmark Channel, there's two ways you can get Hallmark Channel for super cheap. One is you can get what's called Friendly TV, F-R-N-D-L-Y. It's friendly without the vowels. Um, they're super family friendly. They're amazing. Five ninety nine a month, five dollars ninety nine cents a month. No monthly commitments. I'm a big fan of Friendly. But also if you're like, I can't even do that, I am doing a giveaway right now on my Instagram with Friendly TV so that you could tune in to Snowkissed this Saturday, Hallmark Channel at nine. And when you do that, it helps me a lot, helps my ratings, which helps Hallmark rehire me. Um, and the next one that I'm working on that starts filming Thursday is called Love is Trending. I play a social media marketing guru and um, I go home to help my friend get married and I return home to my maple farm, you know in Vermont. <laughs> so that's like a very much a popular, that can be a popular uh, destination for Hallmark movies, Maple Farm. So it's cute. And when you're watching Snow Kiss this Saturday, 9 p.m. Eastern time on Hallmark Channel, uh, when you're watching that, remember the story of the vomit. I can't, wait. know, it's almost a bombing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a comedy. It's like very comedy. So if you need to laugh, uh, hopefully. And then, you you know what? And don't, doesn't all society need to laugh right now? Don't we all need a, a laugh? I'm a, I'm a firm believer that laughter is good medicine. You know, mm-hmm. Becca says, thank you for both for doing this live video. I'm a licensing worker and you both talked about so many important topics that affect foster parents on a daily basis. Uh, thank you. Hey, Becca, thank you for joining us. Samantha says, can't wait to watch. You are great. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching that movie myself um, this Saturday night when we are at uh, our vacation. All right, listen, I, I want to put a plug in here with the Foster Care Institute. If you don't get the Foster Care Institute newsletter, just type in I want newsletter, put your email address, the Foster Care News of the Week, the Foster Care 101 Video Tip, the Foster Care Webinar of the Week, Motivational Moment, and a whole lot more every Tuesday. And on Fridays, we have the Foster Care, uh, Friday Foster Care uh, Tip of the Week and the Inspirational Note. So I want to make sure you get that. So if you don't get it, it's absolutely free. Type in I want newsletter, put your email address, and we'll make sure you get that. Foster Care Institute um, question, I'm sorry, that newsletter, you're reading questions here, that newsletter uh, this week. Hey, Jen, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. You're fantastic. Uh, You probably, my friends, you probably can see why um, I enjoy working with Jen. She's so down to earth, so funny, so natural, and a great parent and strong advocate for kids and families in crisis. So, Jen, I want to thank you, say thank you for uh, for this again. It was fun. Thanks for having me back. All right, my pleasure. Enjoy Canada, my friend. And bye, everybody. This has been Foster Talk with Dr. John and Dr. Jeff. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye.